Hi, I'm Pastor Gretchen Hope Wilson, pastor at Green Mountain Presbyterian Church in Lakewood, Colorado. We are pleased that you are joining us for this recorded worship service for Sunday, August 16 of 2020. Maybe you found us through the church website at www.gmpc.net or on our YouTube channel at Green Mountain Presbyterian Church, Lakewood, Colorado. Maybe a friend told you about us or sent you the link but we are most pleased that you are joining us for worship this day. And we do pray that as together we join in worship, even apart our hearts are together through the Holy Spirit, we do pray that you will feel the powerful presence of God with you. We continue in our Unraveled series, and today we will be joining our hearts around the story of Moses looking more deeply at all of those key players who helped to save his life. This very one who God would ultimately use to save the Hebrew people from the clutches of Pharaoh. May God inspire us this day as we gather around this story to think about the people who have helped us on our journeys of life and faith. May God inspire us this day to think about others that we might come alongside during this time. May it be so. Good morning. My name is Walt Isaac, and I'll be your liturgist for this morning's service. Our service will begin with the call to worship. So if you will join me, I will read part, and you will then respond under the all section as we go on together. When you dream, what do you dream of? We dream of children who know love and churches with open doors. We dream of rest and sunny days. When you dream, what do you dream of? We dream of peace without walls and equality for all people. When you dream, what do you dream of? We dream of milk and honey food on tables, and an end to suffering. We dream of the Church of Jesus Christ serving all God's people. Family of God, this day we dream together. This day we worship together. For there is nothing on heaven or on earth strong enough to unravel God's dreams for us. Let us worship holy God. Amen. Our service continues with the unison prayer of confession and connection. Gracious God, we do not know the plans you have for us. We do not know or can we place our children into good schools. We set aside money for days to come. We keep our fingers crossed and try to control the world around us. 
Having faith in the midst of uncertainty has never been easy for us. Forgive us for the moments when we refuse to trust you. Strengthen us so that when life unravels, we are strong enough to turn to you. That is our prayer of faith. Amen. Please take a moment now for your own silent prayers and petitions. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Exodus, verses 15 through 22 of chapter 1. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. 
Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading continues with the story of baby Moses, now moving into Exodus, the second chapter, verses 1 through 10. Let us listen then again for God's holy word to us this day. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her own son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we give you thanks this day for the powerful story of baby Moses. And we think of all those involved in saving his life. And we pray this day, as we look at this story, you would be with us, that you would help us to see the people and places where we need to be a part of work that brings mercy and life to others. So bless us this day as we gather around your holy word. We ask it in your gracious name. Amen. When I was in seminary, there was an opportunity to do research in New Testament studies. And you could do research in a certain area and then submit that research proposal to a board at the seminary. And if you were deemed worthy or if your research was considered of enough interest and value, there was this possibility of being awarded a New Testament fellowship so that you could continue working in that particular area of research or another area. And as I finished up my research proposal and submitted it to the committee, there was a group that would review it and make a recommendation, and then they would decide who might be awarded this particular New Testament fellowship. It happened that one night, a member of that board called me and there was this edge of anger in his voice as he started talking to me about my research proposal. He started attacking my work and undermining it and pointing out all of the flaws that he saw in my thinking and pretty much lambasting me for about a half hour on the phone and then hanging up. 
As you might imagine, at the end of that call, I felt flat-footed as if I couldn't find my footing. I didn't know how to start walking forward into this process. I didn't know whether to ask the committee to withdraw my proposal, given that he was a member of the committee and thought that it didn't merit going f further. I, I was truly at a loss uh, to know what to do in that situation. I was fortunate in seminary to have an incredible professor who was my advisor. And something inside of me just said, give her a call and talk to her about this experience and get her advice about what you should do. And so I called her up and she listened to the story of the phone call and what he'd said to me and what had happened. And at the end of our call, she asked me if she could intercede on my behalf. She asked me if she could go to the head of the department and speak to him about what had transpired and get his advice about what we should do in this situation. A couple of days later, I had a call from the head of the department apologizing for the behavior of this professor and saying that he and others believed the research was worthy of going forward and that they hoped I would stay in the process. We all need an ally or an ad advocate from time to time in our lives, don't we? It's hard to admit that that's the case in some instances, but I know for me in that moment, as hard as it was for me to reach out to my advisor and to ask her for help, it's exactly what I needed at that moment. And she stepped in to provide that, to be my ally, to be my advocate at a time when I didn't know what next steps to take. In our Unraveled series, the team pointed me to an article from Nadira Ade. I hope that's how you say her name. And the article is about the difference between being an ally versus being a nice person. And in this article, the author talks about that being an ally means being willing to be uncomfortable, being willing even to be wrong, and trying again and over and over, staying with it is the idea. And that it's not so much about being right as it is about being unwilling to allow wrongs to persist unchallenged. That an ally is one who's willing to step in to challenge something that is unjust. Ade says that being nice is really more um, someone who doesn't want to make others feel badly. And that this call to be an ally means that we're willing to step in and to step up when something is unjust and to challenge it, rather than trying to keep things comfortable and easy and not ruffle any feathers. So an ally, in my opinion, is someone who's willing to trouble the waters and ruffle some feathers if something is unjust or someone is being treated unfairly. My professor at that time was an ally for me. She was willing to step into an uncomfortable situation to advocate for me because she felt like what happened to me was unjust. It's where a person who is concerned, uh, you know, and in contrast, where a person who's being is concerned with being nice won't take such risks. It's about being willing to step into a fight that's not necessarily your own because you see that what is happening to another person is wrong. Maybe you can think about a time in your life when you needed an ally or an advocate. I think the truth is that we all need someone like that from time to time in our lives. It's really what Jesus told the disciples the Holy Spirit would be for them and for us, that the Holy Spirit would be an advocate or an ally, one that would come alongside us and embolden us to act in the world in ways that are merciful and just. I think about our story today from Exodus, the story of baby Moses. And it's clear in the story that baby Moses, who was by Pharaoh's edict supposed to be put to death, that he and his family needed an ally or an advocate in order for him to survive 
in order to save his very life. And so if we think about who the allies are in this story, it seems to me that the first allies that we encounter are the midwives, the midwives who refuse to kill the babies and who do not follow the edict of the Pharaoh, Shifra and Pua, these two women who, when they are confronted about the fact that they have not killed these Hebrew babies, say, oh, well, these women, they give birth too soon and we just can't get there in time. They come up with an excuse for why they have not killed these babies. Talk about allies, ones who risk their own safety in order to save children. And then if we think further in the story, we realize that there becomes this unlikely ally in Pharaoh's daughter, the one who pulls baby Moses out of the river Nile and ultimately saves his life and becomes a surrogate mother for him. It's complex, isn't it? This thing of being an ally, because often it means stepping in where if things were just in the first place, you would not be needed. You think about Pharaoh's mother who had to face that difficult decision when he was just a few months old, wanting to do anything she could, feeling completely desperate to save her baby boy. So desperate, in fact, that she would risk the very waters that could drown him, placing him in this basket with some hope and a prayer that somebody could possibly save him. Maybe they knew that Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe at that time. It seems as if they were standing aside, watching and hopeful. But to think about the kind of desperation of a mom who would take such an action. But if the world had been just in her case, if, if she had not been a part of an enslaved people and under the rule of a Pharaoh, she would not have needed an ally to save her baby. And so part of what gets tricky is that allies and advocates are needed because there are places of injustice and oppression in our world. And so I think we need to be sensitive uh, at moments when we feel called to be allies and advocates, to step in where there's an injustice and to work for what is right, to work for someone's well-being. Because the truth is they would likely want to do that for themselves if they could. And we need to honor their voice and their experience in such moments. It is ironic to think about that this ally, Pharaoh's daughter, who ultimately saves baby Moses, that she literally raises up the man that God will use to deliver the Hebrew people from their enslavement in Egypt. How powerful it is to think about that. Little did she know that she was going to be a part of God's salvific history for the Hebrew people. I think about situations and circumstances in our world today where allies and advocates are needed, where People are needed to come into a situation and alongside of people and to be companions with them and to advocate for what is right and just. But I'm also conscious that as we think about opportunities where we may play those roles that we want to do so with humility. We want to do so when we can at the invitation of those who are pressed. We want to do so with an awareness that their stories and their experiences are primary and that we want to listen to their voices and what they would find helpful as far as advocacy is concerned. Many of us in recent months have either read Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, or seen the movie that was made from that book. And those of you who are aware of it know that it tells the story most closely of Walter McMillan, who was unjustly accused of the murder of a white woman and sentenced to death. And Brian Stevenson, early in his legal career in Alabama, 
meets this man and begins the process of unpacking his case and realize, realizes how many false pieces were a part of the quote-unquote evidence that was used to convict him. And it's an incredible story about injustice in the legal system in Alabama and all that Stevenson had to do to fight for what was right for Walter McMillan, for his innocence and his freedom. If you know something about Brian Stevenson's career, you know that the amount of work that he has done on behalf of the oppressed and the unjustly accused is significant. In law school, he worked as an intern for the Southern Center for Human Rights that was based out of Atlanta. And in that internship, he was a part of the Alabama branch. And there are incredible stories that are a part of the experiences that shaped his calling to work for those who truly were not represented. And there's this incredible story that he tells in the introduction to the book of Just Mercy about meeting Henry the first time that he ever went into a maximum security prison and met someone who was on death row. And he was sent by the Southern Center for Human Rights to simply go and meet Henry and to tell him that they were still looking for legal representation for him, but that they were working to make that happen. And to also let him know that it was not going to happen in this year, that there would be a date set for his execution. And Brian Steven talk, Stevenson talks about how nervous he was entering this prison and going to meet Henry. And that you get the feeling in the beginning, he just kind of bumbles along saying, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I'm just a law student, I'm just an intern, and I, I don't have much that I can tell you, there's not much I can do to help today. And then when he tells Henry that it's not going to happen in the next year, that a date is going to be set for his execution, Henry just keeps telling him, thank you, thank you, thank you, because no one had told him that simple piece of information. And because he didn't know that, he'd not wanted his wife and children to come see him because he was afraid that the only part of the conversation would be around his execution date. And when they broke past those moments in, early on in this encounter, then they began to just be two men conversing together, finding out they were the same age and sharing different things from their experiences. And the one hour uh, went into a much more extended amount of time. And when the guard came to get Henry, he was quite uh, forceful with him and putting him back in handcuffs and in chains. And Brian Stevenson felt horrible for the way that he was being treated. And he knew that it was in part because he'd stayed longer than he was supposed to with him. And into that scene when Henry is being taken away, he, Brian keeps saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he says, don't be sorry, man. Just come again, come and see me again. It was like a lifeline for him to have this sense that there was someone on the outside who would be an advocate and an ally for him. And in the midst of this scene when they are parting, when the guard is being so rough with Henry, Brian Stevenson tells the story about Henry planting his feet and lifting his head up and in his powerful baritone voice, starting into the hymn, I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, point me, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Stevenson talks about this. This was a transformative moment for him and his career. His career is astounding. Not only is he an incredible legal advocate for those on death row, it is said that by August of 2016, he had saved over 125 men from the death penalty. Staggering. But he's also worked 
with children and has helped to achieve United States Supreme Court decisions that prohibit sentencing of children under 18 to death or to life imprisonment without parole. Over and over again in his career, he has been and continues to be an ally and an advocate for the most vulnerable and oppressed. It's significant when you look at his record of the things that he has achieved. But I think what's so profound to me about Stevenson's career is the place out of which it comes. And early on in the book, he tells the story of his grandmother, who was the daughter of people who were enslaved in Caroline County, Virginia, and how she told the stories that she had learned from her family about their experiences as slaves and the deep impressions that that made upon Brian Stevenson. But one of the things she would often say to Brian is, keep close, keep close. And she would hug him so tightly. And when she'd release him, she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if he said yes, she'd let it go. But if he said no, which he said he was often tempted to do because of the powerful experience of being in the embrace of his grandmother, she'd grab him up and hug him tightly again. And she'd say, you can't uh, understand most of the important things from a distance, Brian. You have to get close. You can't understand most of the important things from a distance, Brian. You have to get close. Friends, that's what we see in our story for today that people got close. The midwives got close as they saved babies from death. Moses' mother and his sister got close as they took the risk to place him into the waters and to stand near at hand to see if some, some hope was there, if some hands might also get close and pull him from the waters and save him. To be an ally or an advocate means to be willing to get close, to be in proximity to others. It means being willing to get close enough to see what is unjust and where mercy is not present. It means being willing to hear the stories of the oppressed and the vulnerable and the misused so that we can understand the depths of the injustice. As Stevenson says about his own journey, the distance I experienced in my first year of law school made me feel lost. But proximity to the condemned and the people unfairly judged, that was what guided me back to something that felt like home. Friends, I don't know for myself or for you in the days that are ahead where we will be asked to get close to be in proximity to those who are hurting, to those who need a listening ear, to those who are oppressed, to those who are experiencing some form of injustice. But each day, simply when we wake up and listen to the news, that we know that such is the case in our world. And I pray that when those moments come when we can be an ally or an advocate for others, just like Christ has been for us and just like the Holy Spirit is in our lives now, that we can do so from proximity, from the kind of attitude that says, I'm willing to come alongside of you and to stand with you if you want me here. And I want to hear your stories and what is on your heart. And I want to learn from you so that if there is something that I can do to be a support and a presence in your life, if there's some way that I can advocate for what is more just or fair or right in this world, in ways that honor you, the one that has experienced mistreatment, then I want to do that. May God give us grace to know when it's time to get beyond just being nice and to be an ally or an advocate for another in ways that are life-giving for them and life-affirming of them. May it be so. Alleluia. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh God of life, we praise you. We know that you are the one who loves us with a steadfast and an everlasting love. And we trust that no matter where we are or what we're doing, you hold us close. And so we praise you. God, sometimes our lives become difficult and even unmanageable. And in those times, we struggle to find you. Yet we trust that even then, you hold us close and that your love is stronger than our struggles and our doubts. And so we praise you. Creator God, many of us are struggling today. Some of us feel isolated and alone. Some are hungering for the touch or the embrace of a friend or a loved one. Some of us are longing to hear the words that we took for granted not too many months ago, when in worship we said to one another, may the peace of Christ be with you. O oh God, fill us today with the peace of Christ, which we know passes all understanding, and we will praise you. Lord, today we are aware of so many needs within our church community. Some of us are alone and grieving the loss of a loved one or a friend. Some of us are recovering from surgery while others 
are dealing with intractable pain. O oh God, inspire us to minister to and with one another, sharing prayers and cards and calls, so that your love will flow from us and through us to one another. Oh God, our lives have been turned upside down this year by this coronavirus. We worry about friends and loved ones who have been exposed. We're concerned about families who are worried about sending children back to school. And for school teachers who are worried and unsure of what's going to happen when they go back to the classroom. Oh God, hear the prayers of those who are worried and concerned and we will praise you. Lord, this summer has been hard on our nation in so many ways. There have been protests and upheavals that leave some of us confused and angry. We're sure that some of these protests only provide cover for those who want to engage in criminal behavior. Yet we give you thanks for those who are bravely speaking truth to power for those whose hearts are in the right place, demanding changes that are so long overdue. Help us to hear their message, especially when the message challenges us and makes us angry. And even then, we will praise you. Oh God, we give you thanks for your people, who even from ancient times have protested injustice. We thank you for Moses' mother and for the other Hebrew women who risk their own lives to save the lives of their children. We give you thanks for their bravery and for the example that they are for each of us. And Lord, we praise you. Oh God, hear us now as we join together in that prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now in the middle of August, I invite you to continue checking your church newsletter, the Connections newsletter, to see who's having a birthday, that you might reach out to them with a call and well wishes. Friends and members of Green Mountain Presbyterian Church, we continue to be so thankful for your ongoing financial generosity to the church. You are helping us to stay strong during this time, and we are deeply appreciative of your kindness. Please know that August is one of those months in the year this time that we have five Sundays and on the fifth Sunday of each month when we have a fifth Sunday, we take up a special offering for our Deacon's Assistance Fund to help those who are having needs at this time. So now in the middle of the month, I invite you to ponder as we get closer to the end of August, what you might do on that fifth Sunday to give assistance to others through the Deacon's Assistance Fund and that special offering.
a few announcements for you today. If you are seeing this recorded worship service prior to 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, know that you are encouraged and invited to join us for our prayer fellowship time via Zoom. The link for that is in the Connections newsletter. Know if you'd like to go a deeper level in conversation with us about the scriptural text each Sunday or the sermons, you are invited to join us for the Unraveled Small Groups on Wednesdays. There's a group at 9 a.m. in the morning and 7 o'clock at night, and again, the links are in your Connections newsletter. Or you can go on the church website at www.gmpc.net and go to Worship Discussion and leave a comment for us, and then we will get back with you and see what we might do with our conversation about God's Word at this time. Know that we have one more gathering of the Episcopal Presbyterian small group in our study of Marcus Borg's book, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, and it will be this Thursday at four o'clock, and you are most welcome to join us. If you are not getting the Connections newsletter or have a message for the church office, please give us a call and leave that message at 303-985-8733 or reach out to Fran in the office at office at gmpc.net. May God be with each of us as we ponder those in our lives who have been allies for us. May we think deeply about the very truth that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and dwells with us as an on ongoing advocate for us. And may we in turn be allies and advocates for others, especially those who are oppressed, for those who are in situations of injustice, for those who are mistreated. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you deep and abiding peace, both this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen.